Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. I'm Jed York. I am the CEO of the San Francisco 49ers. Um, and and I, I'm the chair of the Common Spirit uh, Health Foundation Board, which has been an, an honor and a pleasure for me to be a part of. Um, it's, it's awesome to be here tonight on behalf of Common Spirit and our board of directors. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this evening's forum. Uh, social justice is a form of health justice, and this is something that we've really pushed and, and talked about in, in terms of making health justice a, a very important issue. Um, I, but we're really here to honor a, a good friend of mine, a good friend of ours, former mayor, and, and just all around superhero. And, and I think we all know who that is, Mayor, mayor Willie Brown. So let's give Mayor Brown a huge <laughs> round of applause. I, 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 I remember one of the first meetings that I had with Willie, and we were discussing if anybody read some of the ESPN articles about the very, very interesting NFL meeting that we had yesterday. I, I won't share things that happened in there, but the article does a pretty good job of doing that. <laughs> and I will never forget Mayor Brown telling me when we started working together and doing things, and he, you know, his, his law background and everything that he's done and everything that he's accomplished. He said, you know, Jed, do you know what the E in email stands for? Yeah. I said, you know, no, no, I don't, Mr. Mayor. He's like, it stands for evidence. Don't send emails. So I, I've tried to take that to heart, and I, I've tried to explain that to my colleagues at, at the NFL. Guys, just don't, just don't send emails, and let's not do that. Um, but getting back to the program, I, I want to take a, a moment to thank my fellow board members who are in attendance. I think Leela Agnew is joining virtually from New York. Uh, Fred Najar is here. Uh, Dr. Alicia Jackson is here. Janet Riley, Lloyd Dean, and obviously the man of the hour, Willie Brown. Uh, we have so many of our corporate partners in the room tonight, including our event sponsor, Genentech, and thank you to each of you for your support. Um, this is such a wonderful building. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm so glad that we can be here. I, I was a part of the, the foundation board at the, at the Commonwealth Club when we built this building. And I mean, it's, I think it's one of the prettiest views in the city and it's just such an awesome, awesome place. So thank you very much Commonwealth Club for, for having us here tonight. Um, th this series, we're, we're trying to have important conversations about, you know, not just social justice, but, but, but health justice specifically. And our goal with this series is to expand awareness to the audience outside of healthcare on the topic of health justice. And I know for me as a board member, learning more and more about this topic, there are things that you just don't realize that exist. And, and I hope that this conversation tonight is enlightening for everybody and helps people understand some of the issues that we have to work through and continue to work on. You know, achieving health equity and creating lasting social justice for all means that systematic and structural barriers and community disparities need to be eliminated. And, and I think we're starting in the right direction, but it, it takes conversations like this and it takes a group of people like this to really make that happen. Many of these disparities have deeply rooted or deeply rooted causes that stem from unjust policies and programs that exist across the country. And I know for somebody that has certainly had my share of social justice and getting to hear from either side of the aisle, whether they like Colin Kaepernick or they don't like Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> I, 
I think it's, it's very important that when you actually sit down with people, they're trying to make a change and, and, and make a statement that, that you listen to, to where they're coming from and actually understand where they're coming from. And, and I hope that, again, I think the Commonwealth Club is, it was born as a space to do this, and I hope that this continues to be a space for us to, to, to make this effort today. Um, you know, in an effort to overcome these barriers, the foundation and the Commonwealth Club are bringing us together and, and bringing leading voices together. And we thank you for just being here and, and, and just being willing to do that. And I'm, I'm delighted to introduce a very, very special surprise guest who's going to introduce today's panel. Um, Sydney Brown is Mayor Willie Brown's youngest daughter. She recently graduated from USC and similarly to her father, she is engaged in politics. Um, Sydney was the VP of the College Democrats at USC, the largest college chapter in the state. She worked in Washington, D.C. for Speaker Pelosi, um, Chairman Hakeem Jeffries, Senator Cory Booker, and Barbara Lee. Sydney now works for an organization called The Next 50 that invests in candidates in swing states and districts. Um, she is definitely a chip off the old block. <laughs> so please spare no expense and spare no sound in welcoming Sydney to the stage. hear me it's on <laughs> it is so good to see everyone Jed thank you so much for the kind introduction I so appreciate it like Jed said this is literally the best crowd ever it's like all friends and family and so I am so excited to see all of your wonderful faces tonight um, thank you so much to the Commonwealth Club and to Common Spirit for hosting us thank you thank you thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about my lovely father uh, Mayor Willie Brown so I have no doubt and all the confidence in the world that everyone in this room knows who Willie Brown is. Um, <laughs> and, and so I don't need to list off his numerous accolades, but I can tell you that there are certainly many. Um, I am the proud daughter of a man who has dedicated his life to fighting for social justice. I'm the proud daughter of a man who has passed some of the most consequential civil rights legislation that this city, this state, and this country has ever seen. I am the proud daughter, yes, thank you. <laughs> I am the proud daughter of somebody who has single-handedly paved the way for the rest of the country to follow in California's footsteps. And so I am just honored and excited to be here tonight. And I'm excited to share with you um, a brief story, uh, a more personal story, um, you know, in the, in the vein that this is a Lifetime Achievement Award about triumph over adversity. Uh, back in 2017, uh, my dad and I took a trip to a town. Uh, some of you might know, he is from a small town about three hours outside of Dallas called Mineola, Texas. Uh, it's where he grew up. It's the type of place that only has a couple thousand people, no building that's more than two stories high, and the type of place where everybody uh, knows everyone. Now in 2017, this was my first time uh, visiting Mineola, and so he was delighted and excited to take me around to show me, you know, where he grew up, to show me the downtown area, to show me where, as some of you might know, one of his greatest achievements, he'll tell you himself, um, he, he urged President Clinton to put a Amtrak station in Mineola so that the folks of Mineola would be able to leave Mineola and, and, <laughs> and gain access, you know, to the rest of the country and the rest of the world in a way that was quite unprecedented. Um, and so as we were walking around down downtown Mineola, we stopped in front of a movie theater. And some of you might also know that one of my dad's favorite things to do in his free time, um, you old San Franciscans will certainly know from all of his writing in the column about it, but is to go and see movies. It's like his favorite thing to do. And so we stopped at this movie theater and we stopped right at the front doors, the double glass doors that you or I would know, just, you know, you'd go and buy a ticket. Um, and I could tell that he had a hint of sadness and a hint of surprise in his face as we walked past this movie theater. And so we sort of paused outside and I said, oh, you know, this is a movie theater, like, why are we stopping? And he said, well, do you see those two glass doors right in the front that we could go in and purchase a ticket for any movie that we wanted, any movie we wanted to see, we could just go do it right now. And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, do you see the doors about 30 feet down that way on the side of the building, the one that has the sign that says emergency exit up over the door frame? I said, yeah. And he said, well, that's the door that I used to have to enter through. But it didn't say emergency exit at the top. 
it said coloreds enter here. And it was in that moment that I had a, a very introspective you know, moment of reflection. And I thought about, and so I want you all to think about you know, with me for, for a second, what it means for a child to grow up in that type of environment where they're faced with such violent levels of discrimination every single day. A child growing up in a place where they're not good enough to walk through the double glass doors. In a place where they are faced with such enormous levels of pain and adversity every single day. So I want us all to think about that and to then think about the grit, the hard work, and the tenacity that it would take for someone who grew up in that environment to pack their bags, come to San Francisco with nothing but a cardboard box, put themselves through college by being a janitor, put themselves then through law school to become something. And not just to become anybody, but somebody who became strong enough not only to bust through those doors, but to make sure that those doors stay open for everybody, everywhere, of any background, of any identity, for generations to come. That's what my father spent his life fighting for. And I am so proud and so deeply honored that he spent so much time opening doors for the black community, for the LGBTQ plus community, for my Latino, Latina, and Asian brothers and sisters, for our friends in low-income housing, and for so many others. And it is things like that that remind me what makes Willie Brown, Willie Brown. And so without further ado, it is my absolute honor to introduce our esteemed panelists tonight, Janet Riley, who is president, give it up for Janet Riley, everyone. <laughs> who is president of the board at Clinic by the Bay. It is an extraordinary organization that is volunteer powered, that provides free healthcare to uninsured communities in San Mateo and San Francisco County. So Janet, thank you for everything that you thank do. You. <laughs> Dawn Porter, give it up for Dawn Porter, everyone. <laughs> who is an Emmy-nominated, award-winning documentarian and social justice advocate. Don, thank you so much for being here tonight. And the man of the hour who needs no further introduction, former speaker of the California State Assembly, former mayor of San Francisco, my extraordinary father, the Honorable Willie L. Brown, Jr. You didn't tell me you were coming here. Right? I'm surprising you. <laughs> so Mayor Brown and Don Porter, thank you so much for being our distinguished guests and panelists this evening. Much appreciated. Thank you, of course, to the Commonwealth Club and the Common Spirit Health Foundation for bringing us all together for this important conversation. Thank you to all of you for being here. It looks like it's a full house. This is just wonderful. So a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, any electronic devices that you brought, anything that buzzes or rings or lights up, if you could turn that off, that would be great. And we want you to be a part of this conversation. <laughs> it, yes, I, I heard his in the green room. <laughs> We want you to all be a part of this conversation. So during the program, the people are gonna be coming and collecting your question cards. So if you have any questions, please just give them to the folks who are collecting them. And for those of you who are watching virtually, use that chat function. And we're gonna gather your questions there. So I'm looking forward to a great conversation. So as you already know, tonight's topic is social justice as a form of health justice, which uh, Jed talked a little bit about it at the board of directors at Common Spirit Health Foundation. We do talk a lot about this. Over the last two and a half years, we know that the pandemic has highlighted longstanding inequities in healthcare, taking a greater toll on the Latino, Latinx, and black communities. And that's even after the last few years where we've had more access than ever to healthcare because of the Affordable Care Act which reduced the number of uninsured Americans all throughout the country, regardless of racial and ethnic groups. But that racial health gap still remains. As a matter of fact, it's just as large as it was almost two decades ago. So very little movement. There are several reasons for this. Of course, fewer healthcare providers in low-income communities, poor living conditions, and fewer cultural competency healthcare providers in some of those lower income communities. So tonight we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into this topic and I'm particularly interested to hear um, some insight from our, from our panelists. So let's begin. 
And I'm gonna pose this first question to both of you. And how do you think these concepts of health justice and social justice are intertwined? And Mayor Brown, I'll start with you. No. Okay, Don. <laughs> I wanna hear from her. Okay, Don, we'll start with you. Um, well, first I'll say it's uh, delightful to be here. Um, my family and I lived in San Francisco for six years before the lockdown um, and came to love the city. We believe in, we believe in Kaepernick. Um, <laughs> but speaking, speaking of social justice, but I also do love Jimmy G, so there you go. Um, uh, you know, when you think about it in its most basic form, um, if you're, if you don't have access to health, if you don't have access to health care, um, all of your other rights don't matter if you, you can't access them. Um, and what I have seen in many iterations, many films and projects that I've worked on, um, is just how fundamental um, access is. Uh, so uh, I did a, a short piece um, with a physician who's uh, in the East Bay. Um, and she has created this island of healthcare services that is a holistic healthcare healthcare service provider, where they were not just, it's a pediatric office, um, and they weren't just treating the children, they would ask the parents and the caregivers to fill out a survey about their living conditions, because living conditions are determinants of health. Right. And what they were finding is, this is the ACES study, yeah. um, well-funded. So what they were finding is that children with a certain number of ACEs, which are essentially stressor, social um, uh, determinants, um, have higher incidence of cancer, yeah. of asthma, of kidney disease. Um, and so this is directly traced to poverty. So when we address poverty, um, when we address a whole person, and you're, those, these are intimately involved in healthcare. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I've seen, and we did, um, I did a series with <clears throat> um, Oprah and Prince Harry, and um, their focus was mental health. Yeah. And so I really think it's so important that we, we have to talk about mental health and access to mental health care when we talk about health. Um, and that is also a justice issue. I think we saw from particularly exacerbated by pandemic, but certainly predating pandemic, um, the stress that people, which is also, also part of a poverty condition, um, but the stress that people are feeling uh, can sometimes you know, overwhelm their daily living. And so we have to um, look at people as whole people um, and providing access diagnosis and then access to care. Um, it's all intertwined. It sure is. Mayor Brown? Yes, this nation um, for a very long time has been plagued with um, institutional racism and discrimination. And in that way, it evidenced itself dramatically among black people. Yeah. At one time, blacks who wanted to be in the health world, who wanted to provide any form of assistance, educationally speaking, could only go to about two medical schools. Yeah. Two medical schools in the whole nation. And it was that way for a very long time, till Brown versus the Board of Education and then beyond. There never was an occasion uh, for black people in this country when you seriously thought about any of the kind of things that addresses health care from a preventative standpoint, health care from an ongoing treatment standpoint. Many of us were delivered as kids, as babies born by what was called midwives. So there has been for years the, the institutional acceptance and acknowledgement of racism by this whole nation. And so when we talk about how do we bridge that gap, 
we really do have to start in the place that Donna talked about, and that is a level of, of accessibility with a system that needs to acknowledge and understand how much of a obligation the system has to extend the opportunity uh, for uh, health care. I, you know, I came to California from a place called Mineola, Texas, that two or three people reminded me about. <laughs> uh, I'm amazed that these people are investigatory. This, <laughs> this social media stuff is devastating. I can't even, there are no secrets. Yeah, I can't even, no longer represent it that my real name was William Winsfield Gregory III. Uh, <laughs> but I got to tell you that the whole business of being uh, delivered by what we call midwives. Yeah. And it was just delivery. There was nothing post-birth that followed. And if that's how your world starts, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that there is a dramatic difference in healthcare between people of color and other people. Yeah. And like I said, that gap has remained for decades. It's difficult. It takes change. Change does not come quickly. But we're making progress. But you're right. It's we are making. We are, I must tell you, we are making tremendous uh, progress. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, in spite of what I will never admit to, I have never been totally and completely healthy. <laughs> <laughs> So we are making progress. <laughs> you seem pretty healthy to me. Don, as a filmmaker, you have made a number of films that chronicle injustices in our society. Um, Gideon's Army, the story of three black public defenders in the South, uh, The Spies of Mississippi, about a state commission that tried to preserve segregation in the 50s and 60s through a spy network. How have you witnessed systemic racism disproportionately affect the health of low-income communities and communities of color? Um, you know, it's so interesting. You, you uh, healthcare um, and the, the lack of access and the discriminatory, um, f you know, the uneven distribution of services mm -hmm. It really undergirds so much of my work. So um, in Gideon's Army, we had public defenders who are, um, often they were like the first line of, you know, like people would see the public defenders and they hadn't seen anybody else with access to a system that could give them benefits. And yeah. so I would see the young lawyers, you know, we were talking about Jeff Adachi earlier, the San Francisco public defender. And in Jeff Adachi's office, they had, um, you know, a mental health practitioner um, because San Francisco has this revolutionary mental health court where people were treated not as criminals, but as people with a mental health condition. So mental health inset interacts with the law. But people also would look for referral for social services because there wasn't any other way for them to, to interact with the government. Um, I'm right now developing a project with uh, Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton, um, and you know, they had identified today. You know, you talk about disparity um, in uh, Mississippi. There's a doctor from Nigeria, and he came to practice in the United States. So now Nigeria is importing physicians to Mississippi. Um, so, but the the primary focus, he came to just do basic health care. Right. But what he found is um, an epidemic of amputations because people are not being treated for diabetes, for kidney disease. And have that preventative care. And then there's a whole, so, you know, he, we started out looking at just inequities, poverty yeah. in the United States, and that was the biggest story, was that there is a, a rampant system of amputations. And if you think of all the complications that happen from amputations, yeah. you can understand like how that is, that is you know, um, astounding. Um, my grandfather was a doctor, was a surgeon, 
He went to Meharry, uh, one of the two places where African Americans could two. could go. And he, my family grew up in New York City, but they would go in the summers to North Carolina to provide services because there was no health care. Yeah. And he would do everything, and he would get paid in chickens, and um, you know. But um, one, one a lesson that my mother taught me is that she would go with her father to see people, and they would have to go to them because people um, there are also barriers to getting to care. That's right. And and I think so. I, I it's just so. Um, inspiring to hear about your clinic and to hear about other efforts like that. And, and um, it, it doesn't take that much to actually create a, uh, not that it doesn't take that much, but relative right. Right. to what we spend in this country, we should be able to provide more access for services for people. So. Um, yeah. Well, no, there was also. <laughs> yes. There was also a common distribution of information about health care from other than black people, black doctors, because there was so many examples of using black people as the test yeah. ground for certain kinds of treatments yeah. at Tuskegee. That's right. was a place that uh, almost every black person in this country knows that there was something about Tuskegee that adversely impacted black people uh, at a time when the country really did not care. There's also a clear among black people understanding that there were certain kind of well, illnesses that black people suffered from that were not ever addressed by anybody. And, and uh, there's a doctor that I saw earlier here tonight. That Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> I served on the board of an uh, uh, organization that he uh, created uh, after being incredibly successful at the, at the biotech companies, but they were not doing black uh, mm. issues. They were not extending uh, their research into the black world for sickle cell mm -hmm. yeah. anemia. Yeah. And to that end, he recruited some of us uh, to join him in that effort, and some of us did. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the, the one black governor of, of Massachusetts, Devon Patrick, joined us uh, in that effort. And it was frankly amazing uh, that after all those years, we had not had a real dedicated quality pursuit on the research side of how do you treat and how do you deal with the unique disease that affected black people. It didn't affect very few non-blacks. As a matter of fact, I came to the conclusion uh, at one of the years that I served that the people that it did affect didn't know they were black. They obviously were. Uh, uh, because they, they, they didn't just break it acknowledge news. it. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't acknowledge it, but uh, because the effect was there. And the same goes for a whole series of others. The, the whole business of, uh, of, 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 of diabetes that you talked about, we dedicated ourselves as political types, and I'm sure your clinic does, the, the, the uh, diabetes that affects children generates a lot more uh, attention for resources and for brain power than anything having to do with diabetes generally, and in particular, diabetes that affects black folk. It's very clear that they, they isn't even understanding that some aspects of diabetes may have something to do with diet in a, in a, a dramatic way. In the social service delivery system, 
did not include that on the unique side uh, for, for uh, on the black side. So the whole system of medical uh, and healthcare delivery uh, in this country it needs to be revisited uh, right. with uh, every aspect of uh, how uh, it's treated. And you know, I oftentimes talk more about the, the black system and the black treatment, uh, but you know, in this town, we got a lot of Asians, and there was a time when Asians could not go to a hospital. We had to do, in Chinatown, we had to do our own, I'm, I'm almost Chinese in that regard, <laughs> because we, we had to do our own hospital, literally. Right. Uh, and the Chinese community really dedicated itself, uh, and the Asian community, but in particular the Chinese community, dedicated itself to address uh, the absence of uh, medical attention and health care uh, to Chinese. And I suspect that's why now almost every medical graduating class anywhere in California got more Chinese in it than almost anything else. Uh, because the Chinese community in and of itself decided we really need to do something about producing um, more people that can uh, deal with the issue yeah. well, in, in every way. And, and believe me, that is one of the things that we really do need to do uh, as a society. When you talked about Jeff Adachi and how uh, he addressed the, the mental health uh, component, for a long time there was no such thing as crimes that were being committed that came from a mental health breakdown, not from anything else, period. And they were not treated, they were treated as just crimes. Adachi's uh, stewardship and Adachi's creativity uh, helped change that outlook as you described it. And he did so, believe it or not, not because it was needed in the Japanese community, but it was needed in the general community. So if we could somehow begin to really include all the communities in the addressing yeah. of the healthcare right. delivery, accessibility, and opportunity for treatment, um, we could really change, and you are correct, that it has to have a foundation attention to poverty. Well, lots of good things happening. I mean, in California, I think we're in the second year of our rollout of CalAIM, which is completely transforming the Medi-Cal system in this state. Much more holistically, much more patient-centered, taking these diagnoses out of silos, treating the whole person, and, and Gavin Newsom's care core, talking about being able to really treat people who otherwise may not you know, uh, accept treatment right away with mental health issues and we are making you know some some great strides particularly in California but but as we know this gap still still remains I which also means oh, Jenna, that we really do need uh, to bring uh, organizations <laughs> that are advocacy groups yes to the reality that people may not have the judgmental ability to make a decision about what ought to be done vis-a-vis -vis their condition. I maintain that 75, 80% of the people in what we call the homeless category are all there because of something having to do with health, yeah. period. It is not an option that they're exercising. They just don't have, because the resources are, available, but if you can't access the resource, yeah. and then there's a lawsuit if you impose it. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to bring the healthcare 
to meet people where they are. Absolutely. I mean, Don touched up on this. So it's, a, it's just getting to a place where healthcare is provided. Sometimes it's it could be you know miles and miles from where we live. The transportation system is not good in many of the places where you've done films. I mean, it's a we really need to meet people where they are, and I think that's what we're beginning to understand in modern medicine. But Mayor Brown, let me ask you a question. You touched a little bit about um, some old policies, and many of the health disparities that we see today really are deeply rooted in policies like segregation during the Jim Crow era, redlining. How are we able now to, to recognize these policies, current policies or laws at a local or state uh, federal level? And what should we be looking for? Well, you know, it, it, in the world of po politics is where I <laughs> am from, <laughs> and not too far away from. Uh, but I have to tell you though, that the office holders elected persons seldom if ever have elevated health care to the highest level of attention politically and intellectually they need to give to it. And I would say to people who are trying to make a decision about who you ought to vote for, you ought to put health care at the top of the list, the attention uh, that needs to be paid. Uh, and to the extent, just think about it, the amount of money we're spending on people who are in the world of homelessness, if we could somehow address just that collection that's dramatically uh, in need of mental health assistance, we could probably cut our cost yeah. in half, period. But we politicians don't run for office on the basis that we're going to cure the problem of health care accessibility. Very few of us, we talk about everything else except that which is, could make permanently a difference in our delivery system and permanently uh, adjust and, and reach us the whole business of the cost yeah. uh, of government. And so I would say that we ought to be about trying to constantly elevate uh, the level of dialogue about health and the, uh, as has been done. And one of the amazing things, that we politicians don't learn a whole lot uh, that stays with us, uh, but the Democrats won the House back and reelected Nancy Pelosi and the foundation of that was the Affordable right. Care Act. That's right. When it became very clear that the business of being not covered because you have a pre-existing condition, and when everybody found out that they were talking about their relatives, <laughs> That's right. They voted for the person that wanted to provide for pre-existing coverage. And the Democrats won. They had no other basis on which they won. They won strictly on the basis of the Affordable Care Act and that component, three existing, pre-existing conditions. And believe me, the, the Republicans had no idea how important that was. Had they had any idea, they would have pulled that out <laughs> separately, <laughs> and it would never have been part of the deal. They would have adopted it. That may be how we can begin to move the health care. Because I think every family has a semi-nut in their family. <laughs> and if we could begin to address that issue effectively, we might be able to do what we did with the Affordable Care Act. I, I made a film, um, yes, please, yes. for the Affordable Care Act, for health insurance for everybody. 
Um, I made a film called uh, The Way I See It, and it's about uh, Pete Sousa, President Obama's White House photographer. Um, so Pete was President Obama's White House photographer for eight years. He was with the president every day. Um, and so documented not only his personal life, but also his major legislative accomplishments. Um, so some of the, the more famous images are the image of Hillary Clinton looking when Osama bin Laden is killed, Pete's in that room. Um, but the night of the Affordable Care Act, and President Obama uh, told us this after, um, was one of, was probably his, his you know, other than the birth of his children and his marriage, was like the thing that made him, made it all worth it for him. And so I recently was looking back at some statistics, and I'm pretty sure, um, but Sydney will correct me because she's the policy person, um, <laughs> it's, it's something more in north of 92% of Americans are now covered with health insurance. And 31 million people. Yep. Yeah. Which more is people. astounding when you think of where we were. So is the Affordable Care Act perfect? Of course not. But you have to start someplace. Right. And what it also did is it changed people's minds. Yeah. So that people don't believe it's odd to request coverage. Yeah. Yeah. They think they're supposed to have coverage. Right. And then the, now the goal is just to make it better. Yeah. Um, but you know, watching the images of President Obama personally calling yeah. every member of the House, even the Republicans, and saying, does someone in your family have a pre-existing condition? Right. And that old-fashioned you know, politicking um, you know, and, and so there was a win, and we can have wins, um, we hope. And we have to give a lot of that credit to Nancy Pelosi as well. You know, we're very proud of her for it, absolutely. No, it's game changing. It's, it's not perfect, but it is, you know, millions and millions and millions of people now have health coverage. I think she said she was going to beat people up if they didn't. That's right, vote for that's it. right. You know, you know, the, the, well, the political world is interesting in that some people wander into it almost accidentally. But uh, I don't know, it must have been maybe the early part of the fifth century when uh, a guy named Lord Dean showed up here right. to rescue the, the Catholic nuns who yes. messed up a system apparently. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and at the same time, at the same time, another another guy named uh, uh, Bernard Tyson mm. uh, got somehow the control of the board of Kaiser. And suddenly, if you recall, we had <laughs> in San Francisco, by, starting about 2002-2003, two black guys running the biggest health systems outside the University of California, which you have, uh, one of the two that reached more ordinary people yeah. and more people who couldn't afford coverage yeah. than almost any other delivery system. All the previous systems went by the board compared to what these two guys were able to do with their boards. Uh, I think we were recruited to go on Lord's uh, uh, board we when it was called Dignity, Common Spirits. I'm still a little confused. <laughs> about, uh, but Dignity was really, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was, when we were really very much involved, and it was a way in which the nature of those delivery systems began to address the kind of things you have found in your film in Mississippi, things that would not have happened at all That's from Stanford's coverage or from the University of California's coverage without this special real attention. And they were clever enough to be involved in the political delivery system, and they had every politician running for anything coming by. Then the guy who ran as a dog catcher would come by to try to somehow align themselves in some fashion with these two powerful giants in the healthcare delivery system. We need to replicate that all over the nation, well, literally, uh, because to the extent that the healthcare, and, and, and by the way, Obama called upon each of those two black guys to uh, impact 
Nancy called upon to impact. That the politicians understood and the politicians loved until this day, I think that impact is still there. And, if, and, and I know that in part that's what moves Newsom, uh, the nature of the delivery system. He, a couple of days ago, somebody told me about uh, uh, some black doctor who's apparently come up with an idea on how to reduce the number of newborns that die because they get suffocated in the crib. Mm. I don't know what they call Sids. that. Sids, yeah. I don't Sids. know enough about that, but when Blanche had her three children, neither one of them uh, <laughs> ended up having a crib problem. But I'm not sure they had a, I'm not sure they had a crib. Uh, but, uh, but it is clear that the political world needs to be activated if we are to address effectively Absolutely. the issue of accessibility, availability, and support services, yeah. including research for healthcare. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit more about mental health. Don, I know that you've done extensive work around mental health and, and well-being. Just last year, you, you mentioned you directed and produced a documentary series entitled The Me You Can't See. It just happened to be that Oprah Winfrey and uh, Prince Harry were your partners in that, in that project. Let's take a look at, at a clip about that series, and uh, then I want to ask you some questions about it. I can put a smile on, but inside feel completely broken. I don't tell this story from my own self-service. I've been through it and people need help. It's just something I accepted. To make that decision to receive help is not a sign of weakness. In today's world, more than ever, it is a sign of strength. Really powerful stuff and important to take the stigma out of mental health. So having done this series, tell me, how do you see mental health as it relates to health justice and social justice? Yeah, um, so, you know, one thing that was, so I know you all want to know, like, what's Oprah like? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, and what's Harry like? What's, what's Megan like? We'll what talk about justice, but um, so uh, Oprah and Harry, I guess they were with some party, big, rich, fancy people, and they got to talking, and she asked him, what do you think the most important issue is facing the world, not just our country, but the world? And he said mental health. Mm -hmm. And so they talked a little bit, but then I think it was kind of like a Saturday night date, like you, you meet the girl, but then she goes away and you didn't get her number. Um, <laughs> and so the way he tells it, he was like, she walked away and he said, if you need any help with that, <laughs> call me. Um, so thankfully she did call him. And you know, the two of them, um, the way we started with co-director Asif Kapadia, um, who directed films like Senna and Amy and um, uh, a lot of other, a number of films. But the, kind of the four of us sat together and, and really Asif and I, our, our job was to listen to Harry and Oprah yeah. talk about their personal experiences. Um, Oprah's uh, school in South Africa, when she first opened the school, um, she said more than half of the girls had extreme mental distress and anguish, mm -hmm. and it was related to poverty. Because she had chosen girls, she said, who were girls like her, who were girls who were smart but didn't have economic resources. And once she brought them out of this poverty situation, she did, does what Oprah does. She, she made them a beautiful campus, and she, they had food. And so first there was a, a situation of hoarding food yeah. because they weren't sure that there was going to be food. Once the girls realized they were safe, they started having mental breakdowns, severe mental breakdowns. And that was when it, she calls it her aha moment um, about the connection between poverty and justice um, and mental health and well-being. And so uh, she has had a number of experiences. And then for Harry, of course, following the death of his mother, um, 
he never dealt with his trauma until he was an adult. Yeah. And so what the two of them did that I thought was um, so great, and we, we all kind of came to this together, and the reason you see that series of folks, some are well-known folks, Lady Gaga, um, but we call her Stephanie because that's who she is, she's Stephanie. Um, and I went to her house and she's very nice. Um, <laughs> uh, and, but you see, you know, we have people all over the world because it's the me you can't see. It doesn't matter where your outside is. Yeah. What matters is what's happening inside and what social circumstance you find yourself in. So for Lady Gaga, she was the victim of a traumatic rape that she had not dealt with. And she had a complete mental breakdown. DeMar DeRozan, um, who at the time, I can't remember which, because he's like switched teams now, but um, DeMar, tweeted about his depression at the NBA All-Star Game, and it kind of like crashed the internet. Yeah. And so I interviewed DeMar, um, and I said, tell me what depression feels like. And he closed his eyes, and he said, it feels like sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and you can't get back up. And I just thought that image was so evocative. And then I asked him you know, some other things, and I said, how come you haven't said anything like this before? And he said, no one's ever asked me. Wow. They ask me how many points I score. Yeah. They ask me yeah. how much money I make. They don't ask him about himself. So the point of the series is that most people are on a spectrum, and mental health does not discriminate. Um, there are certainly you can certainly be more susceptible based on your poverty condition, um, but we're all at risk if we're not cognizant of it and if we're not talking about it and normalizing it. So in terms of justice. I think what Harry and Oprah said is they had resources. When they each realized their circumstance, they could address it. Or for Oprah, when she realized her girls, as she calls them, had resources, she, she could put them places. But for people, we interviewed, um, followed the story of this young boy who was um, a refugee yeah. and had you know come in and was living in Greece in a refugee camp. He didn't have any mental health resources. Sure. So, um, you know, when I think about so many of the stories and the situations that we think about, when we think about what situation, what kind of place we want to live in, where people are able to fulfill basic needs yeah. and do basic things, we want people to be able. If you are um, mentally stressed and in poverty, it's hard to be nice. <laughs> it's hard to be calm yeah. because you're in this constant fight or flight state for survival. And so, you know, assuring that we have good mental and health resources for people, it, it's not a luxury. Like that, you know, the, the state of stress that our society is in is directly, has a direct correlation with the amount of services and investment we put into people. So uh, I was immensely grateful to be able to do this with the two of them because they put themselves out there. So it's on Apple TV, you can see it, it's five hours. Um, we did a whole number of different stories. Um, a big one is mental health on college campuses. Yeah. Um, there's a huge crisis for kids. Uh, a lot of it's social media. Yeah. It's really stressing our kids out. Isolation yeah. is really stressing our kids out. Um, so we address a number of these different, different topics. You know, I think, it, you know, in COVID, the isolation that we had, the, the years spent apart, we really, we need community. I think that some of those, you know, repercussions, we're only beginning to see them now. So, and, and thank you for bringing so much attention um, to this, you know, to this issue. It's, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly important. Don't forget to hand in your questions. Um, I know there are a few more out there, but why don't I start with, uh, the first one's to Dawn. Uh, Don, what's one major aha moment you still reflect on or think about from all of your video storytelling, social justice work? Um, oh gosh, there's so many. Um, I, I, I think I was, my first film, Gideon's Army, um, I was so bowled over by the creativity um, intelligence and passion of these young people. So, um, you know, I, I hadn't spent any time with the public defenders. I, I was a lawyer, but I didn't really understand what public defenders did. Mm. Um, and so I was invited to Alabama to their training session of these um, young people who were in their, it was their first job uh, out of law school. 
and they were talking about the Constitution, like in a good way. <laughs> and they were talking about helping people. And they were talking about like law. And I just kind of like burst into tears. Like, yeah. this is why you go to law school to talk to people. And I think for those of you who work in healthcare, um, that isn't that why we're we're in healthcare to reach people. Um, and so I, I think like I went to Georgetown, I went to a corporate law firm. I, I was quite removed from working with people. And so I, I really felt like seeing those lawyers, um, it just really spurred something in me that to just, I thought, well, I can show people what they do. Yeah. Um, and so I will, um, the other piece of this I will say is there was a young man, you have to see the movie, I'm not gonna tell you what happens, but we, if, there was a young man who was accused of robbery. And he was arrested when he was uh, 16, uh, charged as an adult, which meant he was uh, in jail. Um, and in Georgia, if you commit a robbery, if it's alleged robbery with a gun, it's a minimum 10 years and the maximum life. And he was charged with stealing $250 from a pizza store. I'm not saying you should steal $250. I'm certainly not saying you should steal it with a gun. He was accused, remember accused? Innocent till proven guilty. Um, and luckily his mother worked three jobs to post his bail, which does not happen in most cases. And they went to trial. And when I'm looking at this kid, he had all these tattoos, he kind of had his pants hanging down. And I could hear my grandmother saying, pull your pants up, you know. <laughs> um, and, and I thought, how am I gonna make people care about this kid? Because they're gonna see this kid and think that's the kid I'm afraid of. And so I asked his mother, I said, his name is DeMontes. I said, tell me about DeMontes as a baby. And she says, what all mothers say, they say one of two things, babies are good sleepers or bad sleepers, right? <laughs> and she says DeMontes was a very good baby. And she yeah. starts talking about him as a baby and we show these pictures. Mm. Um, and right in that moment, there's a shift because everybody is thinking about their baby yeah. and they're thinking about her as his mother. And so then when he's on trial, you feel what it would feel like to not be able to protect your baby who was a very good sleeper. Mm. So I, I, I think like the aha is that film really can help you empathize and stand in the shoes of someone who's in a very different circumstance. And people enjoyed that experience. It just made them stop just for a moment and think about maybe if we had some of these police officers stopping for a moment and thinking about them as human beings just for a moment. That's where someone's baby. That's someone's baby. Yeah. It's beautiful. Willie, this one is for you. In reflecting upon your life's achievements, what message would you give to our youth or teenagers on the importance of public service and civic action in order to create a more just and perfect union? Hmm, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure that question can be answered. <laughs> well, why would you encourage people to go into, I, I, to go into public I, service? I must say, though, that in the, the business of trying to be impactful and effective uh, on behalf of all human beings almost mandates uh, one, being adequately trained and prepared, dedicated in terms of preparation, and then constantly keeping at the top of the agenda um, truth mm. in every aspect of what one does and how one does it, period. So I would say to young folk, um, preparation, education, dedication, and ultimately, yeah, delivering. First, obviously, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but then generally 
as you proceed to do whatever you're attempting to do. And in this democracy, the best way to do that is to run for the authority to govern. And then win, and then <laughs> proceed to govern. Yeah. Uh, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of these, you know, seemingly uh, uh, impossible problems to that we have in our world to solve, like climate change or access to health care or, or homelessness, it really begins with, you know, and, and ends with public officials and government. We can have private part, you know, partners but, and we have to, but it's very, but, very important the role of government. But believe me, they're all solvable. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Every single solitary one of them. Or I agree. I agree. Well, this one is to you both. Do you think the pandemic will change our view of health disparities, or will it soon be forgotten? Because certainly that is something. I mean, the pandemic really shined a white hot spotlight, I think, on health on health disparities. Well, the pandemic, um, I think, adversely affected people's desire to be productive on addressing everything. The fear that came with what must have been terrible in the early 20s when something similar uh, affected this nation and the world. Mm -hmm. I recall in the late 40s when it was said that we had had a president who had had a medical condition that ultimately took his life. And somebody stepped forward through the research process and the certification process for vaccinations and I recall that there was a universal application of a small square piece of sugar that had some purple liquids poured on it and it was distributed to everybody and suddenly the disease that killed Roosevelt was eliminated, literally. Of late, some people are talking about it's coming back. Yeah. But everybody in this nation, black, white, and everything, the fear was so great that it united humankind in a way that addressed so that no one would get that disease. And there was no distinguishing between blacks and whites. That little piece of uh, sugar that was made available at no cost to anybody and available everywhere. I never understood why this nation, when we, the pandemic came along, why didn't we use the one component of our system that appears to be available in every town, in every city, the neighborhood school, mm -hmm. the, the, the grades one through seven or eight, every community has one. I don't understand how we didn't do exactly what we've done with that little uh, sugar. I don't understand why we didn't, in the pandemic, distribute the vaccine through that <coughs> delivery mechanism. Uh, we didn't, and obviously, um, uh, everybody ended up, uh, many people ended up not being vaccinated at all. I'm hopeful that the pandemic has taught us the lesson we need to know, because suddenly, universal attention 
on health was focused as a result of the pandemic. And we were really uh, more generous with our distribution of assistance for that purpose. And I suspect in part it was out of fear that you might spread it or I might spread it or everybody out there might spread it and we had to stop them. Yep. Yeah. And that's what we did. So the pandemic may very well be uh, a lesson yeah. well learned, well respected, and well employed. We hope so. Don, what do you think? You know, I think um, one of the, it brought people into the system yeah. Um, who wanted to get vaccinated, but also an awareness of the need to see a provider. Um, so I think that that, you know, and, and certainly a number of children through schools um, will have access to a provider. You know, um, I made a film about abortion clinics in the Deep South. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I saw following these providers for three years is that a lot of the women, most of the women were low income coming in, um, not all, but most. Um, and for some, many of them, it was the first time they'd seen any healthcare provider. So they weren't just getting an abortion. They were getting uh, diabetes screening. They were getting cancer screening. They were getting all the basic screenings that you would get. And so there's a real problem with these clinics closing um, that those are sometimes people's primary care physicians. Um, so... Well, I want to thank you both so much. I think that we are coming to the end of our time here, but an enlightening conversation and really so greatly appreciate your perspectives and all the work that both of you have done um, in social justice and bringing a, particularly some of these really important issues um, to the attention of, of all of us. So we thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being here, for joining us, for our sponsors. I understand that Mayor Breed is here as well. So we welcome here, her here as well. And um, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club now is officially adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.